Level zero. You're standing in a parking lot on a hot summer afternoon. The asphalt shimmers with heat. Suddenly a small funnel of dust and leaves rises before you, spinning lazily, dancing across the pavement like a miniature tornado. It's harmless, almost playful. You could walk right through it and barely feel more than a strong gust. This is a dust devil, and technically, it's a storm. Not the kind that makes headlines or destroys cities, but a genuine atmospheric vortex nonetheless. They form when the ground heats unevenly, creating pockets of rising hot air that start to rotate. They're typically 10 to 50 feet wide, reaching heights of a few hundred feet, with wind speeds that rarely exceed 60 miles per hour. On Earth, they're curiosities. Farmers see them skip across fields. Kids chase them. They're the universe's way of reminding us that weather is just air moving around, trying to balance out temperature differences. But here's what most people don't realize. Dust devils aren't just an Earth thing. Mars has them too, except Martian dust devils are monsters by comparison. Without the thick atmosphere that limits their growth on Earth, Martian dust devils can tower 12 miles high, 50 times taller than Earth's versions, and some stretch half a mile wide. The Martian rovers have photographed thousands of them, dark columns reaching toward the salmon-colored sky, scouring the rust-red surface clean. They're beautiful in a desolate way, elegant spirals of dust against an alien landscape. They're also a reminder that every planet with an atmosphere has weather, and weather means storms. But if you think a spinning column of dust is impressive, wait until you see what happens when a planet's entire atmosphere decides to move at once. Level 1. Now we're talking about something with teeth. A hurricane is what happens when the ocean gets angry. Warm tropical waters above 80 degrees Fahrenheit start evaporating massive amounts of moisture into the air. That humid air rises, creating an area of low pressure at the surface. More air rushes in to fill the void, and the Coriolis effect, that subtle twist from Earth's rotation, sets the whole system spinning. What starts as a tropical disturbance grows into a tropical depression, then a tropical storm. And finally, when sustained winds exceed 74 miles per hour, it becomes a hurricane. The strongest ones, Category 5 monsters, pack winds over 157 miles per hour and can span 500 miles across. Hurricane Patricia in 2015 achieved sustained winds of 215 miles per hour, making it the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. The eye wall, that ring of most intense winds surrounding the calm center, was a vertical wall of violence 25 miles high. Hurricanes are heat engines. They pull warmth from the ocean and convert it into kinetic energy with terrifying efficiency. A single hurricane releases the energy equivalent of a 10 megaton nuclear bomb every 20 minutes. Hurricane Katrina in 2005 killed over 1,800 people and caused $125 billion in damage. But here's the thing about Earth's hurricanes. They're limited. They need warm water to survive, so when they drift over land or cooler ocean, they starve and weaken. Our atmosphere is thick enough to create these beasts, but also structured enough to contain them. Other planets don't have these limitations. And when you remove the constraints that govern Earth's weather, storms stop being disasters and start being apocalypses. Level 2. Take everything you know about hurricanes and multiply it by a thousand, then add another thousand. You're still not close to understanding the Great Red Spot. This storm on Jupiter is so large that three Earths could fit inside it comfortably with room to spare. It's been raging for at least 350 years, possibly much longer. The wind speeds at the outer edges reach 270 miles per hour, and the entire vortex rotates counterclockwise every six Earth days. Unlike hurricanes, which draw energy from warm ocean water, the Great Red Spot is powered by Jupiter's internal heat. Jupiter radiates more energy than it receives from the Sun, slowly contracting and releasing gravitational energy left over from its formation. This internal heat, combined with the planet's rapid rotation, Jupiter's day is only 10 hours long, creates jet streams that would make Earth's look like gentle breezes. The storm itself is an anticyclone, a high-pressure system, which is the opposite of hurricanes. It rises above the surrounding cloud deck like a massive swirling mountain of gas. But here's the unsettling part. It's shrinking. Observations over the past century show the Great Red Spot is getting smaller, losing about 580 miles in diameter each year. We might be watching a 350-year-old storm die in real time. Yet even as one storm fades, Jupiter's atmosphere spawns new ones constantly. The planet's surface is a roiling chaos of storms, dozens of them, some the size of Earth, colliding and merging and tearing each other apart in a dance that's been ongoing for billions of years. But if a storm that's lasted centuries seems impressive, what about storms that move so fast they circle an entire planet in hours? Level 3. Neptune shouldn't have weather this violent. It's so far from the sun, receiving 900 times less solar energy than Earth, 
that by all rights it should be a frozen, quiet ball of ice. Instead, it has the fastest winds in the entire solar system. The winds on Neptune scream across the planet at 1,200 miles per hour. That's faster than the speed of sound on Earth. These aren't gusts or local phenomena. They're planet-wide jet streams in the upper atmosphere, driven by some internal heat source we still don't fully understand. When Voyager 2 flew past Neptune in 1989, it discovered a storm system dubbed the Great Dark Spot, similar to Jupiter's Great Red Spot, but even more dynamic. This storm was roughly the size of Earth, with winds exceeding 1,500 miles per hour at its edges. But when the Hubble Space Telescope looked for it five years later, the Great Dark Spot had completely vanished. In its place, a new storm had appeared in a different hemisphere. Neptune's storms don't last centuries like Jupiter's. They're more volatile, appearing and disappearing over the course of years or even months. Standing on a solid surface on Neptune, if such a thing existed, would be beyond lethal. The wind alone would scour flesh from bone in microseconds. The temperature, negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit, would freeze you solid before you had time to register the cold. But Neptune's winds, as fast as they are, at least blow in predictable directions. What happens when a storm doesn't just move across a planet, but encompasses the entire world? Level 4. Venus is hell. We've established that. Surface temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, atmospheric pressure 92 times Earth's, clouds of sulfuric acid. But the truly bizarre part isn't the heat or the pressure, it's how the entire atmosphere moves. The planet rotates incredibly slowly, taking 243 Earth days to complete one rotation. But the atmosphere doesn't care. The upper atmosphere of Venus completes a full rotation around the planet every four Earth days. This phenomenon, called super-rotation, means the winds are moving 60 times faster than the planet's surface. Picture this. You're standing on Venus in a very good spacesuit. The ground beneath you is barely moving. One Venusian day lasts longer than a Venusian year. But overhead, the clouds are racing around the planet at 220 miles per hour. This super-rotation creates a permanent storm pattern at Venus's poles. Each pole has a massive vortex, a hurricane-like structure larger than Earth, with a dark, swirling center visible in ultraviolet images. These polar vortices don't move. They're anchored to the poles, spinning endlessly as the super-rotating atmosphere feeds into them. The storm at Venus's south pole has been observed changing shape over days and weeks, morphing from a circular vortex into a chaotic, irregularly shaped structure before reforming. It's weather, but not as we know it. But even a planet-wrapping storm system follows certain rules. What happens when a storm becomes so powerful, it starts tearing the planet apart? Level 5. At Saturn's North Pole, there's a storm that shouldn't be geometrically possible. It's a hexagon, not approximately hexagonal, not hexagonish. A nearly perfect six-sided structure, each side about 9,000 miles long, encircling a central vortex at the pole. The hexagon is a persistent jet stream, winds howling at 200 miles per hour, maintaining this bizarrely geometric shape for decades, possibly much longer. We discovered it when Voyager flew past in the 1980s, and when Cassini arrived in 2004, the hexagon was still there, unchanged. It's been continuously observed since then, and it shows no signs of breaking apart or deforming. Laboratory experiments have reproduced similar polygonal patterns in rotating fluids with differential speeds, proving it's a natural phenomenon, but seeing it on a planetary scale is deeply weird. It's like the universe decided to draw with a ruler. At the center of the hexagon sits another storm, a massive hurricane-like vortex with an eye 1,250 miles across, 20 times larger than typical hurricanes on Earth. Unlike Earth's hurricanes, which draw energy from warm ocean water, this storm is powered by Saturn's internal heat, and it's locked to the pole, spinning endlessly without moving. The hexagon changes color seasonally as Saturn orbits the sun. During northern winter, it's golden. As spring arrives and sunlight hits the pole, it turns blue. But fixed storms, no matter how strange their shape, at least stay in one place. What happens when a storm actively hunts its target? Level 6. Now we leave our solar system and venture to a world that redefines the word hostile. HD 189733b is a gas giant orbiting a star 63 light-years from Earth. It's a hot Jupiter, roughly the size of Jupiter, but orbiting so close to its star that it completes a full orbit every 2.2 Earth days. The dayside temperature reaches 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to vaporize rock. But temperature isn't the horror here. It's the wind and rain. The winds on HD 189733b blow at 5,400 miles per hour. That's seven times the speed of sound on Earth. 
These winds are so fast they move around the entire planet, creating a perpetual global storm that transfers heat from the scorching day side to the slightly less scorching night side, and it rains glass sideways. The atmosphere contains silicate particles, essentially vaporized sand. On the cooler night side, these particles condense into tiny glass shards that get caught in the supersonic winds and hurled horizontally across the planet. Imagine being sandblasted, except the sand is glass, it's traveling at Mach 7, and the temperature would vaporize you anyway. The planet is tidally locked, meaning the same side always faces the star. Spectroscopic analysis has detected the cobalt blue color of the planet, caused by silicate particles in the atmosphere scattering blue light. It's beautiful in images, a deep azure marble hanging in space. The reality is an unbreathable, scorching maelstrom of glass shards moving faster than bullets. But at least HD 189733B storms are atmospheric phenomena. What happens when the storm is magnetic? and it tears particles from the planet itself. Level 7. Some storms don't happen in the atmosphere. They happen to the atmosphere. When a star has a particularly violent outburst, a coronal mass ejection, or a solar flare, it releases a burst of charged particles and electromagnetic radiation. These particles travel through space at millions of miles per hour, and when they hit a planet's magnetic field, they can create a magnetic storm. On Earth, we see these storms as auroras, beautiful curtains of green and red light dancing in the polar skies. But for planets without strong magnetic fields, magnetic storms are catastrophic. Mars lost most of its atmosphere this way. Billions of years ago, Mars had a thicker atmosphere, possibly warm enough to support liquid water on the surface. But Mars's magnetic field shut down, likely because its core cooled. Without that protective shield, solar wind and magnetic storms directly struck the Martian atmosphere stripping it away atom by atom over millions of years. The MAVEN spacecraft has observed this process happening in real time. During solar storms, Mars loses about 100 tons of atmosphere per day to space. It's planetary death in slow motion. Some exoplanets have it worse. Hot Jupiters orbiting close to active stars experience magnetic storms so intense that the planet's atmosphere is literally boiled off into space. We've detected extended clouds of escaping gas around some of these worlds. Planetary atmospheres bleeding into the void, never to return. These aren't storms you can weather. They're existential threats that operate on geological timescales, slowly killing worlds. But even atmospheric stripping takes millions of years. What if a storm could destroy a planet in days? Level 8. Stars have weather too, and when stars get angry, planets die. In 1859, Earth experienced the Carrington event, the most powerful geomagnetic storm in recorded history. A massive solar flare ejected billions of tons of plasma directly toward Earth. When it arrived, telegraph systems worldwide sparked and caught fire. Auroras were seen as far south as the Caribbean. The night sky glowed so brightly that people could read newspapers at midnight. If the Carrington event happened today, it would cause trillions of dollars in damage, potentially knocking out power grids across entire continents for months or years. But the sun is a relatively calm star. Other stars are far more violent. Red dwarfs, the most common type of star in the galaxy, are prone to massive flares that dwarf anything our sun produces. In 2019, astronomers observed a flare from the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri that was 10 times more powerful than the most intense solar flares we've ever recorded. Proxima Centauri has at least one confirmed planet orbiting in what would otherwise be the habitable zone. But habitability becomes meaningless when your star randomly blasts the planet with extreme ultraviolet and X-ray radiation. Any atmosphere would be partially stripped with each flare. Young stars are even worse. Titari stars, still in their formation stage, can have flares 10,000 times more powerful than the Carrington event. Planets forming around these stars are bathed in radiation and stellar winds so intense that atmospheres can't accumulate. But stellar flares at least come from a predictable source. What happens when the storm comes from the galaxy itself? Level 9. Space isn't empty. Between the stars, there's gas, dust, and magnetic fields, a thin interstellar medium that's constantly in motion. And sometimes, violent events stir this medium into storms that span light years. Supernova explosions are the most dramatic example. When a massive star dies, it ejects its outer layers at speeds exceeding 20,000 miles per second, creating a shockwave that plows through the interstellar medium like a cosmic tsunami. The Crab Nebula is the remnant of a supernova that exploded in 1054 AD, bright enough to be visible during the day for 23 days. 
The shockwave is still expanding, still glowing, 970 years later. If a star within 30 light years of Earth went supernova, the radiation would strip our ozone layer, exposing the surface to lethal ultraviolet radiation. Mass extinction would follow within months. But there's an even larger scale weather phenomenon, the galactic wind from the supermassive black hole at the Milky Way's center. Sagittarius A, our galaxy's central black hole, occasionally consumes large amounts of matter. When it does, it releases jets of high-energy particles that blow outward into the surrounding space at relativistic speeds. These winds have carved massive bubbles above and below the galactic plane, structures called the Fermi bubbles, each stretching 25,000 light-years across. These galactic winds regulate star formation across the entire galaxy. They're storms on a scale that makes planetary weather look microscopic. But even galactic storms operate in three-dimensional space following predictable physics. What happens when the storm exists outside normal space-time? Level 10. We've reached the edge of what physics allows and what theory predicts might exist in the most extreme environments in the universe. Near the event horizon of a rotating black hole, space-time itself is dragged around in a phenomenon called frame-dragging. Anything near the black hole, including any gas or plasma, is forced to rotate with the black hole's spin. This creates accretion disk dynamics unlike anything in normal space. Magnetic fields twisted into complex spirals, matter accelerated to near light speed, and jets of particles shot out along the rotation axis at velocities approaching the speed of light. These aren't storms in any conventional sense. They're regions where matter and energy behave according to general relativity rather than classical physics where time dilation means events happen at wildly different rates depending on your position, where the very fabric of space is churning. In the ergosphere, the region just outside the event horizon of a rotating black hole, it's theoretically impossible to remain stationary. Space-time itself is rotating, and anything in that region must rotate with it. Then there are hypothetical quark stars, objects even denser than neutron stars, where matter is compressed so intensely that protons and neutrons break down into their constituent quarks. The surface of a quark star might have weather consisting of nuclear reactions and quark-gluon plasma storms, matter in states that have only been glimpsed in particle accelerators. And in the final seconds before a neutron star merger, when two of these ultra-dense objects spiral into each other, the magnetic fields become so intense they approach theoretical limits. These magnetar strength fields would vaporize atoms at a distance. The gravitational waves rippling out from the merger would distort space-time itself, creating tidal effects that would shred any planet unlucky enough to be nearby. These are storms that exist at the intersection of quantum mechanics, general relativity, and nuclear physics, phenomena we can describe mathematically but never experience. And even this may not be the limit. Somewhere in the universe, a storm is unfolding that we don't yet have the science to describe. 